The sunny beaches of Miami, Florida are home to aspiring models, young women that are hoping to be discovered and start their modeling careers. In the 1980s, it was also the place where a dangerous serial killer took his first of at least eight victims. When the police were called to the scene of the first disappearance, they didn't know it was the start of a truly horrific killing spree that would last for six weeks and would cross into nine different states. This is the solved true crime story of Christopher Wilder, the beauty queen killer. Hello everybody, welcome to Murder Monologue. My name is Josh. If you haven't been here before, today we're going to be talking about a solved true crime story of Christopher Wilder. He went on a six week rampage killing aspiring models all throughout the country. If you've seen me before, thank you for coming back. If you haven't, please subscribe to my page if you like my content and we will keep posting. So let's get started today. This whole story is going to begin on February 26th, 1984 at the Miami Grand Prix racetrack. Rosario Gonzalez was a 20 year old aspiring model that actually took a job with a pharmaceutical company to hand out aspirin at the racetrack. So this job required her and a bunch of other models to hand out aspirin at this racetrack. So as you can imagine at a racetrack, you have a pretty rowdy crowd. Rosario Gonzalez and all of her friends that were also doing this modeling gig, handing out aspirin, were getting used to fighting off unwanted advances from all the racers and the whole crowd. As you can imagine, hiring young models to work at a racetrack, you're going to get some awkward situations. Rosario and her other modeling coworkers got very good at deflecting unwanted advances from the unruly crowds there. They would pretend to be just interested enough to make sure that they were able to give them their samples because I'm sure they had to meet some sort of quota or something like that. Um, so they were just flirty enough to get rid of all of the stuff they had to get rid of that day. But eventually, if you came back enough times and you were bugging them, they would tell you to get lost. They were very good at deflecting all of these unwanted advances. It was about noon and Rosario took her lunch break. She was seen by some of her other coworkers walking out to the parking lot to get to her vehicle. As she was in the parking lot, she was approached by a 30 year old. Rosario's coworkers said that Rosario was talking to this 30 year old man out in the parking lot. During the conversation, she looked very comfortable like she had known the person. She didn't seem to be stressed at all. That is until her coworkers saw Rosario get into a vehicle with this man. This would be the last time anyone would ever see her. After she didn't return back from her lunch break, her coworkers got worried, so they called the police. The police came and started questioning a few people. It turns out one of Rosario's coworkers overheard the conversation she was having with this 30 year old man. The man told Rosario that he was a photographer planning a photo shoot and he had ins with all the big magazines and he promised that she would be on the cover of one of them. With her obviously being an aspiring model, she thought this was going to be a great opportunity and got into the vehicle with the guy. Police searched the area and began questioning other people, but they just couldn't get enough evidence or they couldn't get a good storyline to actually pursue this any further, so the case went cold. One week into the investigation of Rosario's disappearance, police received another missing persons complaint. This time, someone called and said Beth Kenyon was missing. Beth was a 23-year-old special education teacher at one of the local schools. She also participated in the modeling world. She would frequently enter beauty pageants and her latest beauty pageant was Miss Florida and she was actually a finalist in that. On March 5th, she disappeared. No one has seen or heard from her in the last several days and that was totally unlike her. Police were called to investigate her disappearance but they really didn't put much thought into it. They actually told her parents that she was young and probably just ran off to have some fun. They proceeded to not investigate this disappearance at all. Beth's parents, who initially called the police to investigate, didn't take this lightly. The police told them that there was nothing they could do and that she was probably off having fun and they kind of lost it a little bit. So they went out and they hired their own private investigator. The private investigator was hired, but didn't really have anything to go on. They did look through Beth's possessions and found a photo album. This photo album had a bunch of pictures of Beth and her friends along with some of her ex-boyfriends. The private investigators decided to take the photo album around town and just start asking some locals some questions. They would stop at all of the local shops around town that Beth would actually frequent. Someone at the local gas station that Beth would go to said that they did see her the day of her disappearance. 
The cashier at this gas station said that Beth was talking to a man about a photo shoot. They said she seemed very comfortable with the conversation, almost like she knew the person. The investigators gave the gas station employee the photo album. As the employee was flipping through the pages, they pointed at a picture and said, that's the guy. It turns out Beth did know the person that she was talking to that day, and it was one of her ex-boyfriends. Investigators now had their first lead as this was the last person known to have seen Beth. So they took the photo album back to Beth's parents to see who this guy was. Beth's parents said that it was her ex-boyfriend and that they had broken up quite a while ago, but they were still fairly close. His name was Chris Wilder. As they were talking about Chris, Beth's parents didn't seem concerned at all. They said he was actually a pretty nice guy and the only reason they broke up was because of the age difference. Beth was 23 years old and Chris was 39 at the time they were dating. So they decided to break it off because they were just on different life paths. Chris wanted to settle down, get married and have a family. And Beth was still young. She wanted to explore her life. So they decided to go their separate ways, but they remained friends. What Beth's parents didn't know was the person their daughter used to date had a pretty troubling backstory. Christopher Wilder was born in 1945 in Australia. He was the oldest of four sons to an American father and an Australian mother. Chris's father was a naval officer in the US Navy, which actually gave Chris the opportunity to have dual citizenship. At the age of 17, Chris and a couple of his friends lured a girl into his truck where Chris sexually assaulted her. Chris was caught shortly after the incident, but only received probation. This was the first time that Chris had a run-in with the law, and it was a big one. He should have been put in prison for this whole ordeal, but since he wasn't, this actually grew his confidence. Chris now thought that he was unstoppable and that the law really didn't pertain to him. He got married in 1968, but his wife quickly left him after one week of marriage. Chris was becoming abusive and she didn't like it, so she took off. In 1969, he was sick of living in Australia. He wanted something new, so he decided to use his dual citizenship and move to the US. His landing spot was Boynton Beach, Florida. After settling down in Florida for a while, Chris decided to start a real estate and contracting company. This company exploded and made Chris very wealthy. However, his run-ins with the law didn't stop. Between 1971 and 1975, he was charged several times with sexual misconduct. Those charges, however, didn't give him a single day in jail. So now, Chris is at an all-time high thinking that he can do whatever he wants, commit whatever crime he wants, and not get punished for it. Because he hasn't been punished for any of his old crimes, he's now advancing to new levels. He now had the courage to lure a young woman to his truck under the guise of him being a photographer for large agencies. He promised her a photo shoot and a modeling contract. As he drew her into the truck, he then forced himself on her and committed sexual assault again. Once again, Chris was caught for this sexual assault. He was charged, but never spent a day in jail. Now, before we go back to Beth's story, Chris now has at least four convictions of sexual assault or sexual misconduct and has received zero jail time. This is all he needed to gain enough confidence to advance to murder. Now, back to Beth's story. The private investigators that Beth's parents hired contacted Chris to question him about that day at the gas station. Chris told the investigators that he did see Beth that day, but they just had a quick conversation and went their separate ways. Chris told the investigators that he was really busy and had to go, but he invited them over to his house. The investigators took him up on that offer later that day. However, when the investigators got to his house, Chris wasn't there. The investigators knocked a few times, there was no answer, so they decided to look around. As the investigators were looking around outside Chris's property, they noticed some trash cans. They decided to look through his trash and found a picture of Chris with a Porsche 911 car. In the picture, they recognized the background. It was at the Miami Grand Prix racetrack. The investigators, now having this picture, did a little research and uncovered that Chris actually raced his car at the Miami Grand Prix several times. They also found out that Rosario Gonzalez went missing at that racetrack a couple weeks prior and Chris was there. They now have two missing girls that are potentially connected to Chris. After doing even more digging on the Rosario case, the investigators found out that she also had some prior encounters with Chris. Apparently Chris had offered to take some pictures of her during previous encounters. 
With this newly uncovered information, Beth's parents, along with the private investigators, contacted the FBI to inform them. However, the FBI still turned down the case, saying they didn't have enough information to go on, and it wasn't necessarily the FBI's jurisdiction at this point. So now, Beth's family knows that the police and the FBI aren't really involved in this case. They don't really care. It just seems like they're shoving everything aside, and they don't really want to take this case on. So this obviously makes Beth's parents super upset. They decided to leak the information that they had gathered to the press. What they decided was that they were going to leak as much information as they could without actually giving out any names. They wanted the public to know that Chris was their main suspect without actually naming his name. So they told the public that the person of interest was a race car driver at the Miami Grand Prix Raceway. They also said he was Australian born and owned his own real estate and contracting company. This basically named Chris Wilder without actually naming him. Everyone knew it was him. This media leak finally got the attention of the FBI and they decided to investigate a little further. After they got involved, Chris's troubling past was finally uncovered. They found out about all of his past sexual assault charges and sexual misconduct charges. On March 21st, the FBI found out about a Tallahassee, Florida woman that was abducted and taken across state lines into Georgia. After this woman was taken across state lines into Georgia, she actually escaped. So she was waiting in Georgia for the FBI to contact her. This report now gave the FBI full authority over this case because it crossed state lines. So they all rushed to Georgia in an effort to question Linda Grover, the survivor. Linda Grover was 20 years old, and on March 20th, she said a man fitting Chris's description stopped her at the shopping mall she was at. At the Governor's Square Mall in Tallahassee, Florida, Chris Wilder stopped Linda Grover. He then offered her a photo session for a modeling agency. He told her that he had ins with all of the large magazines and was able to get her on the cover. Linda, having her guard up, declined the offer from Chris. This, however, set him off. Chris was not used to being told no and not used to getting in trouble. So he followed Linda out to the parking lot where her car was. He then attacked her in the parking lot, tied her hands and legs up and shoved her in the back of his car. Chris then drove her across the border into Georgia and stopped at a motel in Glen Oaks. He purchased a room at this motel, took Linda into the room and sexually assaulted her multiple times. Not only that, Chris now went as far as to torture her. This would be the first time that Chris is noted to change his MO. He ended up gluing Linda's eyes closed with super glue. He also applied copper wires to her feet and sent electrical charges through them, essentially electrocuting Linda. When she tried to escape, Chris would catch her and then severely beat her. Linda informed the FBI agents that she was able to escape into the bathroom and lock the door behind her. After the door was locked, she started pounding on the walls and screaming for help. Knowing that someone would probably hear her, this scared Chris enough to make him flee the scene. Chris got back into his car and drove away. Linda did make enough noise that an employee from the motel unlocked the door and found her locked in the bathroom. The FBI agents quickly showed Linda a photo lineup. She immediately pointed out Chris Wilder. This gave the FBI enough evidence to issue an arrest warrant for Chris. They also were able to obtain a search warrant for Chris's house. With that search warrant in hand, they kicked open his front door. What they found was nothing. Chris packed up all of his belongings and was on the run. They figured he had been on the run since the two private investigators originally contacted him. All of his clothes suitcases, and most of his belongings were cleared out of the house. Shortly after searching through his house, the FBI put out a bulletin notifying all the agencies across the U.S. about his vehicle. They also notified all of the financial institutions, asking them to contact the FBI if Chris used a credit card. On March 21st, 1984, a telephone repairman in Central Florida spotted something in a nearby creek. When he got closer, he uncovered the body of a 21-year-old Teresa Ferguson. Witnesses say they remember seeing Teresa Ferguson on March 18th, about three days after her body body was discovered. They said they spotted her leaving a shopping mall with a man matching Chris's description. Autopsies showed that she had been beaten, likely with a tire iron, and then strangled to death. The FBI, knowing Chris's MO, knew this incident was also likely pointing to him, but they obviously didn't have enough evidence to go on. 
but they suspected they now had a serial killer on the loose and they were about two weeks behind him. The FBI then received a tip from a bank in Tampa, Florida, where they caught Chris on video camera taking out $19,000 in cash from all of his accounts. This was enough money to get Chris wherever he wanted to go. The FBI was now essentially chasing a ghost. By March 22nd, Chris was already in Texas. There, a witness saw him approach Terry Walden. Terry Walden was a 23-year-old wife, mother, and nursing student at the local university. Again, sticking with his MO, Chris asked Terry if she would like to model for him. Terry initially turned down the modeling gig, but somehow two days later came across Chris again. On March 23rd in a nearby shopping mall, Chris was there trying to lure his next victim when he spotted Terry. Chris followed Terry into the parking lot where he attacked her. He grabbed her from behind, stabbed her to death, then dumped her body in a nearby canal where she was found three days later. He then took her car and drove off. Chris's original vehicle was found nearby. The FBI did some forensic analysis on the vehicle and found fibers of Teresa Ferguson in it. The police knew that Chris most likely took Terry Walden's vehicle, so they notified all the agencies across the country what her vehicle looked like. It was a 1981 purple Mercury Cougar. Once the FBI put out this alert, they were inundated with leads and couldn't keep up with the amount of information being passed to them. With all the leads coming in, they couldn't really keep up, so they had one viable option, which was essentially to wait for Chris to attack again. It didn't take long either for the next reported attack to come in. On March 25th, Chris abducted 21-year-old Suzanne Logan at the Penn Square Mall in Oklahoma City. He took her 180 miles north to Newton, Kansas and checked into room 30 at the I-35 Inn. He then drove her to Junction City, Kansas, where he stabbed her to death and dumped her body under a cedar tree. Suzanne's body was found by a local fisherman. Again, once the FBI found the body, they didn't really have anything to go on. They were essentially following this deadly trail that Chris was leaving, but they weren't able to get ahead of him. However, their luck might be changing. The FBI finally received their first tip that might get them ahead of the beauty queen killer. Chris had used a stolen credit card to check into a motel in Rifle, Colorado. The FBI quickly mobilized a tactical team to raid this motel room. When they got there and entered the room, the FBI looked around and found nothing again. Chris had left a couple hours prior to their arrival. Chris has now abducted five people and killed four of them. The FBI was now getting desperate to capture Chris. He has abducted five people and has killed four of them, and it doesn't seem like his reign of terror is going to stop. They now notice that he was sticking strong to his MO. He continued to travel west from his original hunting grounds in Florida. On his way west, he would stop at local malls and lure his victims in by saying that he was a modeling agency with ins on all of the big magazines and would be able to get the women on the covers of these magazines if they would just pose for photos. Once he had the women lured in, he would abduct them and kill them. It's been four days since Chris was able to lure his last victim. He was now getting hungry for his next one. He now had Cheryl Bonaventura in his sights. On March 29th, Cheryl was seen shopping at the Mesa Shopping Mall in Grand Junction, Colorado. At the shopping mall, Chris was able to lure Cheryl in by using his usual cover of being a model agency. He then abducted Cheryl and they were last seen at a diner in Silverton about 100 miles away from the original abduction site. According to the staff at this diner, Chris said they were headed to Las Vegas. The next known location was in Page, Arizona, where Chris and Cheryl were seen checking into the Page Boy Motel. Chris then shot and stabbed Cheryl to death around March 31st near the Knab River in Utah, but her body wasn't found until May 3rd. At this point, the FBI knew Chris had been on the hunt again as he hasn't gone more than three or four days without killing someone. They knew they had to put a stop to him, otherwise the bodies would continue to pile up. The FBI notified all of the malls across the country, telling them about Chris's MO. They also told all of the malls to be on the lookout for Chris and posted his pictures everywhere. Despite being warned about the MO of Chris and what Chris looked like, a mall in Las Vegas hosted a cover girl competition on April 1st. This competition was essentially a fashion runway to seek new models for the cover girl magazines. They did not care that Chris was on the hunt 
in that area. They still held this competition and didn't even increase security. This cover girl competition drew a crowd of young amateur models looking to break into the big leagues as they walked the runway at the fashion show. Lurking in the crowd was none other than Chris himself. This was the perfect cover for him. His MO was already perfected as being a fashion photographer, and this played right into it. He was easily able to lure his next victim. 17-year-old Michelle Korfman was an aspiring model and was in this competition. As you can imagine, at this competition, there were cameras everywhere. These beautiful models were walking the runway and people were taking pictures. There was a picture that caught Chris stalking Michelle as she was walking the runway. Michelle's body remained undiscovered near a Southern California roadside rest stop until May 11th. She wasn't identified until mid-June via dental x-rays. Chris had bound and gagged her and sexually assaulted her repeatedly. She also had several incisions on her body that were about an inch deep. These incisions were not meant to kill her, but meant to cause pain. It was essentially a method of torture that Chris used to keep the thrill going. It was at this time that Chris was labeled a sexual sadist by the FBI. With no other leads and no other place to turn, the FBI had to go to press conferences. During their press conference, they put him on the top 10 most wanted list. Chris's image was now plastered all over the news. Everyone knew his name and what he looked like. However, this press conference did little to stop the urges that Chris was feeling. In fact, by the time he was placed on the most wanted list, he already had his next victim. On April 4th, near Torrance, California, Chris lured Tina Marie Risco into her car with the promise of a modeling photo shoot. He then drove her to a nearby park where he began taking pictures of her. Everything seemed normal at first, but halfway through the photo shoot, Chris's demeanor changed. He started to become very aggressive towards Tina. Not being able to take it anymore, Chris pulled a handgun on her and forced her into his vehicle. He then drove her to a motel room in San Diego where he assaulted her repeatedly and tortured her like he has done with all of his other victims. It was at this time where Chris's MO slightly changed again. He actually allowed Tina to live because he thought she would be useful in trying to capture other women at nearby malls. So he kept her alive and took her with him as he traveled back east towards New York. He made stops in Prescott, Arizona, Joplin, Missouri, and finally Chicago. While in a motel room with Tina, Chris turned on the TV and saw the news conference that put him on the top 10 most wanted list. This made Chris kind of freak out a little bit. He started going crazy. He didn't know where to go and he was very nervous. In his panic, he grabbed Tina and took off again. Chris and Tina drove to Indiana on April 10th, where she was forced to help him abduct a 16-year-old, Donette Wilt. Tina posed as an employee and told Donette that she had to fill out an application with the store manager, Chris, out in the parking lot. Once Donette was near Chris's vehicle, he pulled a gun on her and forced her in. He then told Tina to drive to New York. In the back seat while Tina was driving, Chris sexually assaulted Donette several times. Near Penyan, New York, Chris took Donette into the woods and tried to suffocate her. Since the suffocation wasn't working, he decided to stab her twice and leave her there for dead. As Chris got back into the car and told Tina to drive, Donette was still alive. She was able to tie her jeans around her wounds, get up, and flag a truck down for help. This truck driver drove her to a nearby gas station where they were able to call the authorities. She was rushed to a hospital where she underwent emergency surgery. Meanwhile, Tina was still driving Chris in the vehicle. Chris had a funny feeling about this whole situation, so he told Tina to turn around and he wanted to go check on Donette. As they got back to the location, Chris got out of the vehicle and went and looked for Donette's body. As he got to the scene where he stabbed Donette in the chest twice, he noticed she was no longer there. She was gone. Chris now started to panic because he knew Donette was probably still alive and was going to be able to tell the police everything. After her emergency surgery, she came out and was still living. Donette was able to survive her emergency surgery. As soon as she woke up, the police were there and ready to question her. She told them that Chris was headed to Canada and had another hostage with him. 
Meanwhile, Chris has it in his head that he's probably going to get caught soon unless he can make his way to Canada. But the urges of killing another person overcame him and they had to search for a new victim. At the Eastview Mall in Victor, New York, Chris forced 33-year-old Beth Dodge into his car and had Tina follow him in Beth's Pontiac Firebird. After a short drive, Chris shot Beth and dumped her body in a gravel pit. Tina and Chris then drove the stolen Firebird to Logan Airport in Boston. While at the airport, Chris told Tina that he had bonded with her and he didn't want her to be around when the end came. So he actually bought her a ticket to California. Chris bought her a ticket to Los Angeles and told her to get on the plane. Tina wasn't sure what to think. She thought maybe it was a trick and that he was going to be waiting for her when she landed. Um, she had no clue what was going on. She thought for sure she was going to die unless she followed every word exactly. So she was flabbergasted when Chris told her that she was free. Tina did get on the plane, flew to Los Angeles, and police were essentially waiting for her when she landed. She gave a full report to the police and told them that Chris was headed to Canada. Chris was now alone and heading up the East Coast trying to get to Canada. In Beverly, Massachusetts, he attempted to abduct a woman at gunpoint but failed. She got away with her life. This was essentially telling the FBI that Chris was starting to lose control of himself. He was no longer stable. He wasn't able to pull off the cons that he used to be able to, and who knew what he was going to do next. From Donette's story to Tina's story, the FBI knew that Chris was headed to Canada, and it was just a race now to see if they could catch him before he got there. On April 13th, Chris stopped at Vic's Getty Service Station in Colebrook, New Hampshire to ask directions to Canada. Two New Hampshire state troopers, Leo Jellison and Wayne Fortier, spotted Chris and the Firebird that they were on the lookout for. Chris also spotted the state troopers and knew that he had probably been made. So he headed back to the Firebird to gather a gun. As soon as Chris got to the Firebird, Jellison, the state trooper, grabbed him from behind and a scuffle ensued. Two shots were fired during the scuffle. One shot passed through Chris's body and into the other state trooper, hitting him in the chest. The second bullet was shot through Chris's chest again, and this time it killed him. The state trooper was seriously wounded, but was able to recover from his injuries. Under all of the bodies that were killed under the hateful hand of Chris Wilder, the beauty queen killer, were recovered, except for his first two victims, Rosario Gonzalez, and Beth Kenyon's bodies were never found. Chris Wilder, the beauty queen killer, was cremated in Florida. He left a personal estate behind that was worth more than $7 million. The courts decided that the value of his estate would be divided amongst the victim's families. On a side note, Chris Wilder is still a suspect on several other murders. One of the main murders where Chris is still a suspect is the Wanda Beach murders in Australia. This is where two 15-year-old girls were murdered at Wanda Beach in Australia in 1965. Because of Chris's MO, and at the time Chris had several sexual assault charges already, he is one of the main suspects in this unsolved murder. The beauty queen killer is still a suspect on 12 other murders. If he truly was the killer, the police may never be able to solve these cases. Thank you for watching this solved true crime story of Chris Wilder, the beauty queen killer. If you like this video, and want to see more content, please subscribe to my page. It really helps out creators like myself. Bye, everyone.